So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, February the 18th, and this is episode number 147 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. So today it's 18 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Can you believe the opening? Looks like a Christmas card in video. And uh, we had ice and a storm system that's coming right through that's giving us a last punch there. So that's 18 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 8 Celsius outside. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So thank you for being here with me today. And uh, if you want to look down in the video description below, you're going to see what topics we're going to cover. And it's going to be interesting, I hope. If you have questions of your own, just follow the link to my main website, fredsfinefowl.com. And you can fill out a form and leave your own question for consideration for another Q&A. So here we go. The very first question comes from Walter Morgan, Titusville, Pennsylvania. Nice day today. Lots of bees from my Lands Hive out on their orientation flight this afternoon. For those of you who don't know, brand new bees will fly out and do figure eights and they'll circle around in front of the hive and then they'll go back to the landing board then they'll go right back inside. Those are called orientation flights and that's because the bees that have never been out before, which happens this time of year, will go out and register landmarks and then they go back in the hive and these orientation flights get bigger and bigger sometimes it's a corkscrew when they're headed out they corkscrew up like a little tornado in ever widening circles and then they get so high and off they go so that's what they're doing and uh, any advice on how to get any sugar on them where they could get cold where they could get to it if they needed it. I know Dr. Leo says not to do anything, but with this goofy winter we're having, a little insurance wouldn't hurt. So this is a Lands Hive. I have a Lands Hive also, just one. And it is an issue uh, because the way the Lands frames are, the backs of the frames come together and they're airtight. So the backs of the frames, as they're all pushed together, actually become a cover board and the bees can't get up and above those frames in the Lands Hive. One of the advantages is the Lands Hive is heavily insulated. They are surprisingly light on insulation when it comes to the roof that cover the hive. And the way they're configured, they're really not designed for you to feed the bees. But I have an idea for those who still want to do it, even though, as named here, Dr. Leo says, don't, because it's a live and let die practice there. But uh, if you were trying to put something on, let, let's look at the frames. Let's take a fondant, right? If you wanted to put something on, and if you don't, uh, you risk starving out the bees. And we can have rough falls, we can have rough winters, temperatures up and down tend to activate the bees, then they go back to cluster, then they spread out, they go back to cluster. So here's my idea about that. But we need to know, looking at the backs of the frames, kind of where the cluster's located. Because this time of year, February, um, it's likely that they have brood. So they're gonna stay over the brood. In a perfect world, we're gonna put the food directly above the brood. But here's what I don't wanna do. I don't wanna pull apart the frames directly over the brood and expose the brood to the cold air and disrupt that uh, cluster, right? So if you have a way to look at them, thermal camera, something like that, it might even be as primitive and as easy as just, once you open the lid and all the frames form that barrier, remember, so the air's not just flying out of there, rest your hand on it, feel along until you find out where the brood is, because it should be nice and warm right there, especially this time of year, up at the high end of these frames. And then I would go to adjacent frames. If this is the entrance over here, here's the brood, then I would go to one of these outskirt frames and I would actually pull them apart a little bit, about a quarter inch. And then I would take something like a patty and I'd put it straight on there. The other thing is, this patty won't cover the full length of that gap that you're about to make. So I'd also put a wooden shim or something over that. How wide would I spread them apart? About a quarter of an inch. Put this on there, and of course, this is Hive Alive fondant that a lot of us are using this winter. Instead of a little circle hole, I would cut a little strip. Also a quarter inch, peel that paper back, put it right over the top of that hole, and then close it right back up. And now they have access to something. 
The other thing is there's very little space in those hives over the top. And some of them do end up with a, a larger space that you could put insulation and things like that in, but it's up to you to do it. But rather than let them starve, which is the potential, unless you're following the Darwinian live or let die practice, you could put a fondant on, something like that. Because air will not escape. The other thing is some people might say, well, if you do that, didn't you just create a lot of extra space and won't they build a lot of burr comb and won't they just bridge it and things like that? Well, a lot of beekeepers already make it a practice to spread their frames apart and that's so that they actually draw out deeper comb. But what is not happening this time of year is new comb construction. So even though they have brood, even though they're trying to expand and build up a little bit, the weather isn't up to temperature yet, so it's not a time of year that the bees would be bridging everything. So that's an emergency ration. Create that gap, put that on there, close up the extra so you don't just have free-flowing air through there. And then uh, right back, let us know how it works. Because it's just in theory. I'm just thinking that's what I would do if I was trying to save some bees. So if you've done it, if you're trying to do it, because I don't like the frame feeders because they have to be with liquid in the frame feeders. That does not work in the winter time. So fondant would be the best bet. If you put sugar bricks on there, you have to put something over and around the sugar bricks again as a vapor barrier so that the air doesn't rise up and away. And also so the bees don't just come up through there and get frozen and then die on top of the frame bags. So I think fondant's your number one choice for that. That's the end of question number one. And question number two comes from Joe, St. Petersburg, Florida. I uh, read the lives of bees that you recommended. It all makes sense to me. But what are your thoughts on it? I don't think it could ever be feasible in today's beekeeping. Well, what we're talking about is Thomas Seeley's book. And this is called uh, The Lives of Bees. This came out in 2019. And a lot of what's talked about in here is Darwinian uh, beekeeping. In fact, the chapter on Darwinian beekeeping, which I marked here, is chapter 11. So if you haven't looked at that book, it's an outstanding book. But it talks about how when the Varroa destructor mite, which is a parasitic mite that attacks honeybees, showed up here in the United States and its impact on feral colonies of bees, in this case it was in the Arnott Forest, was devastating to the feral bee population and also to those that are managing beehives. So the mite uh, served as a vector for a lot of pathogens and disease that overwhelmed the mites or overwhelmed the bees and then they died. But, and this is the philosophy behind uh, Dr. Thomas Seeley's uh, Darwinian approach, is that uh, even though over 80% of the colonies died out, we look then, and this is where the term survivor stock comes from, those that survived that had mites. So in other words, the mites were not eliminated. The bees were just tough enough to survive an environment with mites present. So this is interesting. Can you do it? Well, we who did we mention just before this? We talked about Dr. Leo Sherishkin. Uh, he has a very natural beekeeping method. The book that he helped edit and publish here in the United States is called Beekeeping with a Smile. And uh, it has the same approach. The bees find their own resources. Uh, they either adapt to the environment that they're in and uh, they either survive winter, they survive small hive beetles, they survive uh, varroa destructor mites, or they perish. And that's the philosophy. So, and it's that hands off, don't feed them, those that make it, uh, you know, the recommendation in Dr. Leo's book is two inspections a year. So, can you do it? Uh, that's the big question, isn't it? Because a lot of people are talking about uh, treatment-free beekeeping, and then you otherwise uh, use integrated pest management practices, which could include brood breaks and things like that. Uh, Dr. Seeley recommends very specific hive configurations, which are modeled after what they find in bee cavities and trees. So then there, we find out that 
the average size of a beehive in uh, in a tree, which is their natural environment, would be about a 10 gallon uh, space. He also adapted his hives to a single entrance. No top venting, no top entrance. That's because uh, that's, they didn't find evidence of that. If the bees did move into a space that had tiny crazed cracking, cracks and things like that that otherwise were venting, he discovered that bees will move into a space that has holes in the upper part, provided they're small enough that they can seal it up with propolis because that's what bees do. So all of these things come together. It's really not as simple as saying, can it work? It has to work within the parameters that are observed in feral colonies in trees. So then there are other beekeepers in the United States. There are entire treatment-free clubs of beekeepers, and you can check in with them and find out what their practices are, how they manage, how they make it. It's a very polarizing thing with beekeepers. So I've mentioned before that you could go treatment-free. I've done it myself. I did it for 10 years. You take losses. For me, you 40% of your hives every year on average. And then of course you build up, and the, the light bulb over the head moment for me doing that was that uh, I don't have any control over the genetics in my area. So I don't have control. I've got other beekeepers within a thousand yards of my bee yard. I don't know what their practices are. I don't know what their treatments are. I don't know if they're loaded with Varroa. I don't know if they're practicing good husbandry. So I don't know if they log in and follow the Bee Informed Partnership best practices, which I highly recommend that a lot of people do. So for me to practice good genetics, every time I lose a queen, uh, the genetics are going to be mixed, and then I may lose the resistance that was built up through working exclusively with survivor bees. So if you're lucky enough, and this is why the Arnott Forest was an interesting place in the state of New York here in the United States, uh, those bees had very little outside interaction. So they were left on their own and the bees that did swarm a lot because it's another thing they do when they're small and then these cavities that are 10 gallons. So that's roughly a 10 frame deep hive, deep box, single. So when they build up their numbers, they swarm out. Well, that in itself is a method of varroa control because there's a brood break. And when there's a brood break, the varroa mites do not have a place to reproduce because they need to be in the capped pupa to do that. So all of these things act together, and even Dr. Seeley, when he gives his presentations, uh, says that it may not be doable for commercial beekeepers. So it's a backyard beekeeper thing to try. There's a lot of interest in this, uh, always, and people have been writing me over the past week about it. One person said that, uh, what if we had a bunch of people together, a bunch of beekeepers that occupy a certain region, and do all the same thing. Well, that model is actually in play right now. And uh, beekeepers have decided as a community to go treatment free, all of them, everybody. And they also decide on a stock of bees. So once they choose the stock, the genetics that they're gonna work with, and they all agree that there will be no treatments. And then they end up uh, losing the stock that can't manage uh, living in the presence of varrodestructor mites that are bound to be there. Are you not getting rid of the mites? What you're ending up with uh, will be a stock of bees that can coexist with varrodestructor mites. So it's much more complicated than people think. This is why I've said in the past I stopped uh, doing survivor stock treatment-free beekeeping. When I was using survivor stock, I buy it in. I buy it in from Bee Weaver in Texas. So if I buy a queen, if I'm totally queenless, which now I'm, I'm very good at reproducing my own bees and creating my own queens, so I don't do very much of that, but I certainly want to support the programs that are working with bee genetics because me personally, I think that's the only sustainable future in beekeeping. If we're constantly having to ramp up treatments and finding new treatments and finding new ways to kill off the varroa destructor mite, without somehow finding better stock that can handle the presence of the Varroa destructor mite. We're setting ourselves up for a time when we're eventually going to hit that treatment wall and we may not find a way to treat or control the mites. And now we have bees that require intervention and treatment. So I understand the philosophy, 
Dr. Leo, Thomas Seeley, the Weaver family, I understand, and more. I understand their philosophies in uh, deciding not to treat that the genetics are the way to go, but they're constantly interrupted by the stock of bees that uh, do require treatment, that set them back by bringing in uh, the diseases that are manifesting in colonies that are being treated or being ignored. And then uh, my practice was, or my suggestion was, if you want to go treatment free, you should still be counting for mites. And when you've got a colony, you have to keep records of your queens and your colonies and your bee performance. If you say have five colonies of bees, two of those end up with high mite counts. They're eventually going to die out and where they're going to go, they're going to drift into your other colonies. So now you have to practice euthanizing the colonies that are not managing with varroa mites. So and a lot of people don't want to do that. So there again, you set yourself up. Now we have a sick colony that infects all the other colonies in your apiary. So it's much more complicated than people think. I highly recommend you read the book. Thomas Healy explains all the details of it. Can it be done? It can and is being done by some treatment-free beekeepers. Uh, the question is, what do you give up in order to do that? This is why commercial beekeepers rarely, if ever, even try it because it hits their bottom line right away. So, you know, you're picking stock based on their strengths. And if their strength is that they're resistant to mites, that might be a trade-off for low production in honey. Or they might not be the best pollinators. Or they might be swarmy, which means that every year they're going to generate another colony of bees. They're going to swarm them out and the numbers are going to be reduced. And that's what happens when they're in a small space. Observation hives. Great example of that. They turn into swarm machines. So there are trade-offs. You can do it, but there's trade-offs. Question number three here. Nathaniel Satterley from Scott, Kansas. What's it say here? I'm getting into beekeeping this spring. My oldest daughter, Amy, who is seven, has been enjoying learning about bees with me. She would like to know, what is your favorite thing about beekeeping? She is also curious, why does the queen bee never use her stinger? Thanks for all your helpful videos. Okay, so this is for Amy, who's seven. The theme of today is encouraging young beekeepers. So the beginning of today's video, the picture that I held up, that's my grandson's uh, Valentine card that he made in school. And it's a honeybee and it says, be mine at the bottom. You put a little bee heart in the middle of it and everything. And he's my junior beekeeper, he's six. So just a year younger than Amy here. And my favorite thing about bees, that is very hard to define. And part of it is, where do you see bees? Outside, they're accessible. So even if you don't keep bees, you can go out in the environment and you can hang out with flowers and you can go into the clover and you can go into dandelions. They're there if you look for them. So they're tiny, miraculous insects. And because they're covered in fuzz and uh, they do a lot of beneficial and interesting things, they pollinate, they gather nectar, they go back, they're a social insect. So... It's exciting to see them, to hear them, to understand what they're doing, to watch them drink water. So if you're interested in nature and in insects in particular or pollinators in general, uh, I just like bees because they are endlessly teaching us something if you really pay attention. So I'm sorry, that might not sound like a very clear answer, but bees are cool. Let's just put it in you know, seven year old terms. But thank you for that question. I like them because we're never going to know everything we can possibly know about them. They're fun to share with other people. They can land on you and look cool. And they make honey and you get honey. And who doesn't like honey? A lot of people don't like honey, but we like it here. So I hope uh, that's a satisfactory answer. But that's today's theme, by the way. Let's help young beekeepers stay interested. Support them whenever we can. Send in questions like that. Question number three from B. Ginner. In the central Texas hill country, our weather bounces around from one extreme to another. On warmer winter days, do the bees inside the hive move the resources from areas farther away from brood areas closer to the brood, providing resources to the cluster during colder days and nights? Thank you.
Okay. Sorry, I forgot that I had a cough lozenge in my mouth here. Um, when it comes to moving stores around and resources, bees do that. When do they do it though? In the middle of winter, what do they have inside the hive? They have capped honey. They've got some stored pollen, we hope, because they're all gonna use that bit by bit as the cluster progresses over the frames. And they use that, of course, to feed themselves. They can generate heat, so they can uh, burn calories to generate the heat, which comes from carbohydrates, which is the honey. And then they feed their bees uh, the pollen, what's often called bee bread. So they've got brood this time of year. Now at night, or when we get a warm up day, let's say anytime it's below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, they're loosely clustered and the colder it gets, the tighter the cluster gets. Now let's say we get this big warm up like we had recently for us, 50 degrees, woo. So it went up to 50 degrees. That means the cluster's loose and some bees will be moving around, but they're gonna be getting water and things like that. It would be extremely rare in February right now for those bees to spread out and be uncapping the cells of stored honey and then drawing the honey out and then transferring that down and then trying to refill cells that have been emptied while the cluster moves through the hive in winter. So that's extremely rare if that would happen at all. So what happens there is the bees are supposed to move over the resources. They don't spread out and bring resources to the cluster. It doesn't mean that when you get a warm up, some of them don't spread out a little bit and then start eating into those cabbings and getting into that honey. They certainly do that. So when do they move resources around inside the hive? I've never seen them move pollen around inside the hive once it's stored. When it comes to honey, while it's still nectar or before it's completely ripe and finished, before they put a cap on it, you do see a lot of nectar moving around. And a lot of things are going on. So when they're first bringing nectar into the hive and they're bringing it into their honey storage area, so those cells could also be drone cells. They get used for nectar storage, which ultimately becomes honey storage, and then they cap it off. Any cell that's open still, the bees tend to work that, and then they'll take little spread out areas and they'll concentrate it. So the bees will be moving the nectar around, the honey around that uh, they've brought in from the outside. Who's doing that work? Resident bees inside the hive. So foragers that are out, when they come in with nectar and they get into the hive, they don't do any messing around with stored cells of honey inside the hive. They have to pass it on through a behavior called trophallaxis. So the bee that sticks her tongue out, that's the bee that lives inside the hive, getting the nectar from the honey crop, from the foraging bee. And they take that nectar on board and then that bee goes and puts it inside the cell and stores it. They spread it out. So I'm sure you've heard this before. They're dehydrating it, they're getting the water out of it. So they use twice as many cells, maybe just shallow filled, half filled, third of the way filled. They spread it over all the available cells and then you'll see the bees go back and then they'll start concentrating it again. As the water evaporates off, they drink it back in and they bring it back and then they put it in the next cell. That's why sometimes when we can look at observation hives, uh, the ability to see them doing this behavior, and it does happen often at night because during the daytime when all the nectar is coming in, it's a frenzy in there, it's a madhouse. So they're rushing around and they're trying to find places to park the nectar. So they kind of do it willy nilly everywhere. And uh, sometimes you'll see a foraging bee come in and does this little waggle dance, gets no interest from the storekeeper bees, I call them. And then you'll see that bee that's been out foraging start trembling all over the place and it runs around the hive trembling just shaking and trembling and trembling and shaking and other bees are not paying attention to it that forager has not found a taker for the nectar that it brought inside the hive that's why it does the tremble dance so now the bee then ultimately what if nobody takes the nectar off of that bee then he goes and eventually just gives up trembling and parks in the corner and just holds it on board keeps it in their honey crop 
and then they can consume it themselves or eventually they'll find a space for it and then they'll unload that. But when you see bees trembling and just running around and looking really unstable and they're obviously their abdomen is extended, their honey crop is full, uh, that's a bee that's trying to unload its nectar. So while those caps are open, they concentrate it. And that's why it used to alarm me when I was first looking at bees. Because, oh man, at first it looked great because they were filling all the frames, all the cells with nectar. And I thought, wow, this is going to be fantastic. Then you check it the following morning and there's a whole bunch of empty cells. But if you look closely, the cells that are still full are much deeper near being capped. So they've actually migrated those resources because the cells are open, because it's a warm day, because they're actually actively storing resources. In the winter time, they're far less apt to do that. I'm not saying it's impossible, highly unlikely. Question number four from MSM. Fred, do you recommend any manufacturer's swarm trap? that can also be used as a newt for keeping bee resources. Yeah, I do. Uh, well, not just one manufacturer, but it's a style that I really like, by the way. And remember, Thomas Seeley, we talked about the lives of bees. Uh, they go into great detail over swarm trap cavity size. What should it be? We mentioned it already, 10 gallons, right? 10 gallons is roughly the equivalent of a single deep 10 frame hive box, which normally is the brood box. But that's not my favorite configuration, although that can work. I like the nucleus boxes, and the ones I've been buying come from Better Bee, Man Lake, Blue Sky, everybody sells them. But you'll notice that the nucleus boxes, and I only buy the wooden ones, I don't like the plastic you know, nucleus boxes or the polystyrene or any of that, the wooden ones, they're solid, they're going to last you the rest of your beekeeping days. And you'll see two configurations. So you'll see the deep box that holds five frames. And I'll get to it in a minute because I know in the back of your head you might have said, well that's not 10 gallons. I know. So when you get the five frame nucleus box, you'll see one that's got a standard entrance board. So it's got a bottom board, it's got an entrance reducer right in the bottom board, just like a regular hive with a solid bottom and an entrance reducer, only it's narrow. That's not the one I like for swarm collection. I like the ones that have the circle on the front and then the control wheel on the front of that. And that control wheel has a wide open. The next setting is queen exclusion, so the queen can't get out, but workers can. And they have another setting for bumblebee exclusion. Bumblebees can't get out, but a queen could. So here's the reason I like it. That little hole gives you complete control. But I don't just use one of them by itself because you can also buy the nucleus uh, second story. So it's a box that you would get that you have the solid bottom board on. So it's just a box for five frames and it's for deep frames. So I take that box, put it on top of my five frame nucleus box and only has a hole in front. And the reason I like it is that bottom board is part of it. It doesn't come off. So all you have is a hole in the front and the wheel that controls it. That wheel is handy. So now we've got an open top. So now we put the second story on there, which is just a deep five frame box. That second story is where you put your five frames. You leave the bottom story empty because it's the cavity that your bees, the scouts are going to show up. They're going to go inside that hole. And you know what they do? They spend a long time in there pacing off the interior surfaces. So when the scouts go in through that hole, and this is where you sprinkle in little bits of beeswax if you've got it, propolis if you've got it. You spread that on the bottom if you don't have frames that are already drawn out. Older comb is really good for this. So if you're swapping out your brood comb from your other hives, that would be a great place to put it in the top. Okay, so we've got a double deep. Five frames in the top, no frames in the bottom, just a cavity with the entrance on the front. Tilt it towards the entrance and use shipping straps to strap this whole thing together snug. Bees remember, going back to the Thomas Seeley book here, if they see tiny cracks, like you've got a migratory cover, which is just a piece of wood on top with a piece of wood on the front and the back to hold its position, that gets all strapped together as one unit. If there's any airflow or any little crevices up there, the bees accept it because they know they can seal that right up with propolis. 
So that's it. Five frame, five frame. The solid bottom that's built in, it's a unit. It's got the hole in the front, the control wheel. So now we open that up. And now you can strap that thing to the side of a tree. So you've strapped it together as a unit. And then another strap straps it to the tree, sets it on a branch. Where should you put it? On average, 12 feet high, facing south by southeast, clear flyway in and out of it, somewhat sheltered, not hidden. And you'll find scouts in that thing so fast it'll make your head spin. The beauty of it is, once it's occupied, look what we have now. Once it's occupied, they won't be in the bottom box, right? Because that's just space. That's the entrance. They'll be up in the frames in the top of the box. You'll take the whole thing off. You'll take that top box off if you want to. And then you'll bring that in and establish that in your apiary. I highly recommend that you leave the other box there. Add another empty box on top that's got five frames in it and put your migratory cover right back on that. Strap it back up and you're back in place because often bees, scouts are competing for the same locations. So when you remove a swarm that you've collected, make sure the box is still there because what can happen right away within a day or two, another swarm can move right into that. And by leaving the bottom box there, it has all those smells because guess what the scouts do? When they find one that looks good to them, that feels right, and they've spent their 10 or 15 minutes or whatever ridiculous amount of time they spend walking the bottom, walking the side, walking the overhead, walking the other side, walking this way, walking front to back, walking the back, walking up again, they're doing that over and over and over. So they've got this built-in way of measuring whether or not this is a suitable cavity for them. And the research has been done. 10 frames. 10 frames wide, 10 frame deep box, or vertical, which would be preferred? The vertical one. So they go to the frames, pull it off, put a new one on, frames in it, catch another swarm, leave it in place, because they're marking the front of it with their mandibles. So the scouts mark the areas that they approve of. On their way out, you'll see them mark it. And when they come back, because remember, bees are visual, you know, they zoom in, they find it, because they, they follow somebody's waggle dance. They find the general area, they land there, they smell that pheromone, yep, our guys are claiming it. So that's when they go in, that's why you leave that there. So those are my favorite. I will put a link to that in the video description to show you which ones are my favorite. Get the double boxes, you move them right into your uh, bee yard, and that's where you can take, remember it's got five frames, and they've already moved onto it, and they're clustered up in there. So now you can take the flat bottom removable board, because the top one didn't have the hole in the front. So now you have that option. Pull the frames and put them in one like that, or you can use the bottom board with the entrance reducer and no wheel on the front, and then just install it right there, and you're good to go. You're going to build up fast. That's my, that's my favorite one. Question number five. Cheryl Heiser, Simi Valley, California. Would you or should you treat a swarm captured in your Colorado BVAC with OAV, which is oxalic acid vaporization, before installing to their hopefully forever home? I'm thinking they'd associate that treatment with the BVAC box and be more happy uh, when they leave it behind and start fresh and varroa free. So, I mean, I understand that that sounds like good thinking. And by the way, the Colorado BVAC is my all time favorite way to collect a swarm that doesn't move itself into a swarm trap, which we just talked about. Just got one last year. They've been around a long time. I had a lot of fun at the uh, Hive Alive convention when Yappy the Bee Man came by. And he talked in the hallway, and, and we talked about that BVAC. I just love that thing. It is fantastic. So, and, and he had a part in working that up. I understand that, uh, I want to say JP the Bee Man also had a part in coming up with the design elements of that Colorado BVAC. And now it's being sold by and assembled by uh, the uh, Better Bee Company. So, anyway. It's my favorite one because it's so easy and it is the easiest thing on the bees. And sure, I know a lot of you are watching and maybe think, but Fred, you said use your giant oversized butterfly net. Yeah, I did because that thing was fantastic too. But Fred, you said use the hive butler and just shake them into that. Yeah, I know. I did that too. 
but that's before I got the Colorado BVAC. So if there's electricity anywhere near where the swarm is, it is my favorite method. And I'm going to link the video. So if you've not seen my Colorado bee vacuum video, I show you start to finish collecting the bees and installing them in the hive. It is the most hands off, easy way to move bees from a tree branch, from a fence, from the side of somebody's house, from somebody's air conditioning unit. It, uh, you can't shake an air conditioning unit and get the bees off of it. You can't shake somebody's soffit, bang on it, and get it out. You have to use brooms and sweep them and do all these things that annoy the bees. The vac, the suction is so low, that's why it really sucks as a vacuum cleaner, but it's, it's great as a bee collector. Because also the tubing that goes to the vacuum is smooth on the inside. So the bees aren't getting jammed in all those ribs that you would have in your shop vac or in your wet dry vac and things like that. And yeah, I bought the 30 foot uh, hose that goes with it. So with a 75 foot extension cord and a 30 foot hose, I, don't, I can be pretty far from somebody's house and still get it out of the tree and, and it goes into the box. This box, you pull the high, you pull the cover off, and it's nothing but a screen, so they can breathe. And then you set that on top of a box, and you pull the cookie sheet out, and now they go down into the box. It really is fantastic. But what would I do? So we did all that. Would I want to give them a treatment while they're in that box? No. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the less you disturb the bees, the less you disturb the swarm from the collection to the hiving process the better for the bees and they won't feel threatened and they won't want to abscond absconding is when the bees change their mind and they leave and i've had one swarm do that one time in my apiary and they were they were pretty skitsy anyway I collected them they were still super active sometimes when they're really active and they don't settle down maybe you don't have the queen that was the other thing, and I mentioned this to Yappy the Bee Man, and he knew right away what I was gonna say, so I didn't even get to teach him something new. Because I said, how do you know when you're using the Colorado Bee Vac, how do you know when you get the queen in there? And he said right away, like he knows what he's doing, oh, they start flying around in the exhaust of the Bee Vac because they smell her pheromone. That's, see, that's what I wanted to surprise him with, but there's no surprising people that do rip outs and this is that's like a full on thing for them. So, but anyway, that's what they do. It's really cool. You'll know the queen is in your vacuum because her pheromone is in there and bees are flying in the exhaust of the vacuum and uh, following that scent in there. So you got your queen. It is like the easiest thing. And because they're low stress, this is what I like to do. We have a lot of time. I don't believe that treating them with oxalic uh, acid vaporization right then is a good idea because it further disrupts them. I don't know that they would associate it with the container that they're in. So once we get them in the hive, now we put feed on. Always put sugar syrup on a hive that you've put a fresh um, swarm capture in because we want them to feel connected to that space as much as possible. And if it's gonna rain and things like that, we want them to start building comb right away. We want them to start establishing themselves right away. And we want them to start laying eggs. So I highly recommend you wait nine days because by the time they occupy it, it'll be several days if that queen is even fertile. Sometimes the queen that your swarm is with is a virgin. She hasn't been through her mating flights yet. She is a little flighty so if she hasn't made it her pheromones not strong she may not have it might be one of those tiny swarms not the big six and seven pound swarms not what we call a prime swarm but if it's a little one chances are she's pretty skittish she still has to make her mating flight which is also why you can't lock her in if you have one of those tiny clusters don't use one of those don't put one of these on there to keep her in if it's a tiny swarm because there's a very good chance that she is a virgin. So anyway, we want them to stay. We want them to settle. We want to see eggs. We want to see some evidence of a commitment to the space. Then treat them with oxalic acid vaporization because the mites are still phoretic and we can knock them out. Over 90% of the mites will die. I highly recommend not doing that until they've settled. But I understand what you were thinking. Let's make them think the BVAC is bad. 
and that the hive is good because they get out of the bee vac where that terrible thing happened to them, but um, much better to get them settled and do as, as little interaction with them as possible and leave them closed up once they're in their space and don't check on them every day because the more you check on them, the more unsettled they feel, the more they feel the space they've occupied is not secure and you could lose them. By the way, the ones that flew away, that while we were checking on them, abandoned the hive and flew up into the trees and took off over a meadow, came back two hours later and reoccupied the hive. Yeah, it changed their mind. So that was good. Question number six, be kind to be free. Can you provide your opinion about what outside temp is better when adding to emergency feed in winter? I see quite a few bee club folks adding bricks in the 40s. I had a gut feeling to avoid opening the highs below 50 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. I know from previous years by not adding food right now that the bees could starve and I've heard them chewing up the candy board. Okay, so here's the thing. You're resuscitating, potentially, a dying organism. So it depends on the situation with the hive, whether or not you would risk chilling brood by pulling off the inner cover. And we know that this year I've been playing with these insulated inner covers. And the only reason I bring that up right now is because this applies to what we're talking about. If I have a fondant pack on this, not just to promote fondant, this could be a wrapid round or anything else, but see how that sits on there? Because this is clear, I can look at it and see what the resource situation is. And I have these on half of my hives right now, and we just had temperatures in the 50s. What came with that? Super high winds. But by looking at this, first of all, we know if we even need to lift it up and take it off and replace it, right? And also there's no airflow through here. So we are not chilling brood. Let's say we get that 50 degree day, it's super sunny and there's no wind. By being able to pull the cover and look at this, no air is leaking out. We didn't chill anything by checking on it. Now let's say that we notice, whoa, they've used up three quarters of this and we need to get a new pack on. So you line up your new pack, you cut the hole in it, you get it ready to go. You lift this one off and you put the new one on, one fell swoop. Chuck that one in your bucket. They're back in service. This is insulated. The only leak path was through the middle here. And they've got resources back on. Now, I know what you're saying. Because I'm clairvoyant. You're like, Fred, I don't have one of those insulated covers. I have a regular cover. In fact, the fondant is underneath my inner cover. So if I pull the inner cover off and the fondant's gone, all the air poofs out. So if you know that they've used up those resources, and this is, by the way, a prime time of year when bees starve out and die. What are the options? Let them starve? Or a temporary blast of cold air that could cost them some brood. There could be some chilled brood and they'll lose it and you'll never know because they'll be getting rid of those bodies. They'll excavate them themselves on the warm days. But without a food resource, the colony could die. So your options are lose some brood, provide some food. I say, yeah, do that. Now the minute you crack it a little bit and you see that they've got plenty of food, close it right back up. Also, have your resource handy, ready to go. Don't pull the top off. Don't pull frames out and look at them to see what's going on. All you're doing is assessing food resources. If they don't have enough, you're going to put that right back on. You close things right back up. And uh, so the difference is starving or getting chilled and then having resources. So if they're truly out of emergency feed, better to put it on there because you're saving their lives you're resuscitating them so these are emergency procedures and i do not recommend that 50 degrees is not warm enough to be pulling things out and looking at things i like temps because keep in mind when you see the thermometer uh if you're look if you have some kind of uh, weather station or something the way i do and if it says 65 degrees fahrenheit it's much warmer than that in the sun and also wind plays, how much wind is there? So if you've got direct sunlight, 65 degrees, you can actually take a peek and see what's going on. It's not the emergency procedure, but keep in mind too that the temperature they're trying to keep their brood at is going to be 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So always have your stuff staged, be ready, do things quick and smooth, and uh, you'll be good to go. But if it's the difference between life and death, if you don't put the feed on there, you've lost them anyway. So chill them and feed them. That's what I say if they're almost out of food. Number seven, Kevin Beavers. Nixa, Missouri. I have built a long Langstroth hive that holds 18 standard deep frames and four flow hive frames. My question is, will 18 deep frames be enough for brood and winter storage? And uh, my bees seem to have made it through winter on an eight frame deep with a medium super for winter storage. And this new hive should uh, have more space in it. So yeah, 18 deep frames. If those are loaded frames going into winter, that's more than enough. Absolutely. Four flow frames, I don't know. So, but 18 frames, definitely enough because you're at almost two, that's almost double deeps. I winter my bees with a single deep 10 frame and a medium of honey. So I know they can make it with what's being described here. And uh, I also made it this way because the dimensions were 36 inches or three feet. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think the bees will fill the flow frames from left to right? Thanks. So here's the thing, Kevin. I've, I don't like flow frames on horizontal hives, but there's a lot of reasons why. One is in a horizontal hive, the bees have to move laterally through your beehive. Bees like to move through the corners of the frames, either the high corners or the low corners in the frames themselves. They don't like to leave the frame and then move around and then come back in. Flow frames are designed to create a blockade on the back. These are, those are flow frame, frames right there. Uh, they come together. There's no place for the bees to enter through the ends like that. They're designed like that. So there's no, in a horizontal format, for the bees to move through the flow frames to the next frames. They either have to be able to go over the top and back down, or they have to go under and come back up. And I'm not sure if they can or would fill the frames at the ends. Um, I like using foundationless and I like using, I have some plastic foundation frames with the wooden frames on them in the horizontal hive. And I cut the corners on the plastic foundation. So the bees have passages through. And uh, if they want to fill those up, they fill them with uh, drone comb, drone size cells. So I don't know if anyone yet who's reported on horizontal hives with flow frames in them being successful. So if you're watching this right now and you do horizontal hives and you've got your flow frames in there and they worked or they didn't, it'd be great to hear from you in the comment section of this video because some people want to know. I've often said that uh, if I'm using flow frames, I'd much rather put them on a vertical Langstroth configuration. So the horizontal, it's a gamble. You spend a lot for those frames and I don't know that the bees would use them, but they definitely have their work cut out for them to use them in a horizontal format. That's not what they're designed for. So, but if you've done it and it worked, I'd like to see it. That'd be great. I'd like to hear about it. Question number eight comes from Frank. Abington, Virginia. I cleaned out the landing board on one of my hives this morning and brought in 48 bees. Six of these bees were revived when I brought them in and I examined all of them under a 4X magnifying glass. I realized this is a very small sample size, but I did not see any Varroa, even on the ones that were still alive. I'm assuming once a bee dies that the Varroa would release themselves and go find another live host. My real question is, all of the bees' proboscis were extended. Is it normal when a bee dies or is there something else going on? So, usually an extended proboscis, tongue fully out, there, there are two things to look for in that circumstance. One, the proboscis out that indicates they could have starved. What's the other thing? The size of the abdomen. So if the abdomen is fully contracted as well, there's a very good chance they starved and died. Proboscis out, contracted abdomen, starvation. Because another example of the proboscis out, but extended, old age, they could die. 
proboscis out, fully extended, they um, could also have been exposed to a toxin, which is unlikely in the wintertime because they're already in. You would have noticed that before. So that's not the end of the world. But the other, the question about the varroa destructor mites, I sweep off the bottom boards and I might wash the dead bees. Not because I think the mites are on the dead bees, because I think they were on the bottom board already because the mites are dead. So why would I do that? I want to see the condition of the mites feet. I want to see if they're being chewed. I want to see if they're being damaged, if they're being torn up by the bees. And that's what I note. So yes, it's true. Bees dying, the mites are going to clamor off that bee, that dying bee, and they're going to move on to the body of one that's still alive because that's going to guarantee their life. They're also going to be trying to get into that brood. Super annoying. Question number nine. William Hass, Charlotte. I'm new to beekeeping and have a question about painting hives. In my research, some beekeepers recommend painting the hives different colors to assist the bees in recognizing their home. While others say plain white is the best color to use. Rather than paint, I use eco wood treatment, which leaves a nice natural wood color. My question is, does having different colors on your hives assist the bees in returning to the correct home? Since the eco wash makes all the hives look the same, I stenciled a large bee on each hive with a different color. Am I wasting my time doing this or is color important? Okay. I like eco wood, by the way. I don't have any white hives. But I know that there are people, white is the only color to paint your hives. I understand. That's what they want to do. And so how do your bees locate your hive? We mentioned earlier that they do these orienteering flights to figure eights so and they're going back in. And then when they're doing the last flight, they do their little corkscrews, ever widening circles, then off they go. They're registering landmarks. So your because remember, bees navigate visually, but they also navigate when they get close into something by pheromone. And that includes flowers, nectar resources, and things like that. They're also looking to see the sources that have been marked by their fellow bees. They mark food resources when they fly away. So they, when they come back, it makes it that easier to locate it. So when they look at hives, this is one of the reasons why. You'll notice looking at my apiary, if you look at videos through the years, um, I'm spreading my beehives out, so they're moving farther and farther away from one another. Uh, the one apiary that's right behind my garage is in a horseshoe configuration. Uh, so each hive is a slightly different angle. Some are next to trees, some are next to different stand configurations, bushes and things like that. So the landscapes, a tree next to a big rock, a tree next to an old sawhorse, a tree not a tree, a beehive that's next to these things. As the bees get closer, they recognize that landscape, they recognize that horizon profile, and they get in close. And then the last thing that they do is they hit the landing board and they smell familiar pheromones to know that they belong there. And they're also being stopped and inspected by guard bees to make sure that the foraging bees pheromone matches. Although a foraging bee with a bunch of nectar and pollen on its legs is going to be welcome wherever it goes, and that's called bee drift. So you'll also see dramatic, this is, if, if you're going for a visual, think of the highly pixelated vision of a honeybee. Plus they're seeing infrared, and I actually did research on that. I looked for infrared paint, and I've noticed that uh, one of the areas where they sell infrared spectrum uh, stickers and things like that is for keeping birds from hitting your windows. So they are, there are stickers that go in your windows that you can see through, but that have this iridescence to them that uh, birds and some other things can see so they don't run into the glass thinking that it's clear and they can pass through it. I don't know that that's very valuable to the bees. So if you're looking for specific colors that bees uh, identify with, some people look at flowers and think, well, if I paint it the color of flowers, then they're gonna recognize that. But it's actually the physical configuration of the hive, the slight differences in those configurations and the physical location. So the farther they are apart, the quicker the bees orient. And then I like doing this too. Did you know that honeybees can count? Honeybees and bees in general are the smartest insects. They're the biggest brained insects. 
How high can a honeybee count? They count to four. Don't ask me the details about how they did the study and how they determined that. But I do enjoy uh, pointing that out to people when they come to visit my apiary because I do have a set of hives that are all identical. And they line up on the exact same hive stand and they're in a row and there are no differences. But they're in a group no more than four because bees can count to four. It's pretty interesting. So these are my nucleus colonies. They're in a group of four. Their entrances are the same. The color of their entrance wheels, also the same. The position of the entrance wheels are the same. The entrance diameter, they're all open to a half moon. So that little hole that's on it, the entrance wheel blocks half of it. Tiny entrances, because the other thing I wanted to see, do those tiny entrances bother them? Now, do the bees fly in, the foraging bees, are they flying in, they're getting confused, oop, wrong one, go over here, oop, wrong one, go over here, oop, wrong one, go over here, and so they don't. They zip straight to the one that they belong to, because they can count to four. Now, change that up. Do this at home for fun. Set up all your identical nucleus colonies, your other bee colonies. If they're all identical, and the entrances, colors, everything else are identical, the configuration is identical, but there's more than four, there's six or seven now you'll find the bee populations building up on the end, one end or another. Because the foraging bees come in, they're tired, they hit the first landing board they come to, they get welcomed in, because why are they heavy? Because they have a bunch of resources in their body and on their legs. So then the ones near the end start to build up their populations more than the ones in the middle, and the bees just don't necessarily orient directly to the one that they want, because there's more than four of them. Now, that's just funny to me. So if you go to four, and it's fun to watch them because it gets validated every time a bee bee lines it right to their colony. And the population does not build up in the end colony, so that's not supported. But you add numbers, great experiment for somebody to do and have a lot of fun with it and see where the bees go. So, but when they get in closest to pheromones, spread them apart, change height even. But bees are very specific. And this is another fun thing too. I don't know if you've ever changed the entrance configuration on your beehive. You have an entrance reducer that sits in the front of your hive. And it's, you know, three inches wide, let's say by three eighths of an inch high. But then you decide, cause it's springtime, you're gonna change it or you have one of the, you know, entrance reducers. It's got a small one for winter. It's got the wide one for summer. You pull it, you flip it. But the wide portion is over here and the little narrow portion is over here. So you close the narrow one and you're going to open the wide one over here. Watch how many bees still go to where the little narrow hole was, even though right here, right there is the new opening that takes them into their hive and it smells right and everything else. But those little bees will be so frustrated trying to go through that exact hole. So they already orient so well to the physical location of their hive that painting it a different color wouldn't necessarily help them, if that makes sense. So I say paint them the colors that you want. Landmarks, location, separation of one hive from another, slows down bee drift, keeps them independent, and increases the efficiency of the foragers returning to the hive. More so than colors, some people paint big X's on top of the hives, thinking that they're like aircraft, they're flying over and they orient, and that's, that's my hive because I recognize the X or the dot. Because I used to do all of those things, but I had no way of measuring whether or not that improved the efficiency of the bees flying back and finding their hives again. But uh, we did learn from other studies that they orient by landscapes, physical configuration, and landmarks. So, good stuff. Good questions, by the way. And the eco wood that I use is uh, with no tint in it whatsoever. The person that posted that question goes on to talk about their tints offered in eco wood. I just use the regular base untinted and I love that natural wood look. And for those of you this time of year who might be getting into beekeeping and thinking about maybe keeping a low profile with your beehives. When we're driving, we live in the country, I can see white beehives half a mile away in a field. So if you're thinking maybe I'd like to keep a lower profile with my bees, I think like eco wood definitely blends with the landscape and it does not hide your hive from the bees. So they can find their stuff just fine. So that's the other thing. How conspicuous do you want your hives to be? Maybe it's a safety issue. If you're adjacent to a park or something like that, or 
residential neighborhood and you want to make sure kids don't just happen into the beehives you definitely want to paint some bright colors to get someone's attention they don't want to be right next to it when they realize well there's a beehive there see what i'm saying so maybe the colors have different purposes for people so question number 10 i live in washington state and this is from gavin lorimer I live in Washington State with fairly cold winters, so I bought BMAX polystyrene hives with the hive top feeders that are compatible. What's the best way to protect bees from UV? I used to have those BMAX hive, hive top feeders, by the way. I think they're the big polystyrene. It matches the whole 10 frame box, and then it's got a clear plastic piece over it, and then the bees go up through the inside, and they go down, and then they drink in the reservoir. I stopped using them because I can't, you know, you can't access that is your hive cover i think if we're talking about the same one so to look at your bees you got to pull that off if it's full of syrup it's a pain but as far as covering them any polystyrene hive needs to be painted because they are not designed to hold up to ultraviolet light from the sun so we paint them with uh, exterior latex paint and will the bees potentially chew polystyrene they sure can they chew right through it sometimes I've had bees, if they can access the surface of your polystyrene, uh, they can chew it. Chickens can eat it too. I've had chickens eat polystyrene insulated lids if it's white. I don't know what it is about chickens to see that. You'd think it wouldn't taste good. Chickens are very good at tasting things. They pick up pebbles, they taste for minerals and everything else. But boy, will they eat insulation and polystyrene. So the bonus question here is, uh, I'm curious if you've seen Jim from Vino Farms Extra Deep Custom Frames he is using only for his brood frames in his custom hives. Any pros to having uninterrupted, uninterrupted comb in the brood chamber compared to the gap, about an inch between comb and the double deep brood chamber? Um, well, this is the whole principle behind the Layens hive is that the frame is deep and continuous and that's because the bees will fill all the honey from the top down and they'll be brooding down low and they brood where near the entrance of the hive so by having a deeper frame the bees that store their honey all up the top they have an uninterrupted progression up that frame so there is evidence in nature that that's an advantage uh, when we of course every time we pull apart boxes to do an inspection we break that material between the bottom of the upper frame and the top of the lower frame in that box. And what's in between there? Sometimes people panic because they pull it apart. Oh, there's dead bees. Look, the brood. That's always going to be a fat little drone in there. And for some reason, people don't feel terrible that a drone was lost. Also, honey pulls apart and things like that. So having an integral, integral, deep frame, integral. <laughs> anyway, having a deep frame that's continuous uh is a benefit to the bees because it replicates nature better so and of course if you're pulling these deep frames i mean a deep frame in a standard langstroth frame is about seven pounds when it's full of honey so and we have the langstroth frames they're going to be much heavier than that so the advantage to a deeper frame is is widely understood so i think that's yeah uh, the thing about creating unique frames or unique boxes that have to have unique frames is now we don't have a lot of interchangeable equipment uh, with your other hives. This is my problem with the Layens hive. It's, I can't just grab frames out of one of those sweet nucleus colonies that I have and fortify or load up a Layens hive because nothing's compatible unless we cut the frames, modify them, and do all this extra stuff. But if you want to see Jim, he's he's definitely insulated his hives like crazy. And uh, he has a custom frame in there. And so I think he's, it simulates to some degree what the Layens hive does, which is a deep frame. Uh, well insulated. The Layens hives are insulated with lamb's wool, sheep's wool, whatever. And I think if you know people, like we have a sheep farmer right up the road from me. I think not all of the wool is good. Uh, I don't know how to grade wool when it gets harvested. You know, they, they shear the sheep. But it seems to me that that would be a great time to become friends with your local sheep farmer 
and say, hey, when you get that will that's not that great, just throw it all in a giant trash bag and give it to me and I'm going to use that to insulate my new beehives that I'm building. Something like that. Because lamb's wool, sheep's wool, I'm sure there's a surplus there that does not make the gray that you could get. Because that's good stuff. And it really is full because the problem I had too with my lay-ins hive is I wanted to drill a hole in it trying to find the framing in it I'm trying to drill a hole quarter inch hole so that i could use my pro vape uh, to put oxalic acid vaporization in it and every place i thought there would be framing material uh the bit just wound up with sheep's wool so that was tough but anyway yeah the deeper frames uh are better for the bees does that mean that if you use separate boxes and uh don't have the continuous deep frames, would you see a noticeable difference? Maybe not, other than that you're more disruptive to your bees and you do risk breaking, you know, mid brood. Like if their brood pattern is between two frames and you're inspecting and taking things apart, that's more of a problem than if you pull up a nice deep frame and then the brood pattern is throughout that deep frame and you haven't damaged or interrupted it. So the continuous frame probably has advantages compatibility problems that's the only drawback i see question number 11 last question of the day from robert hunt marshall missouri let's see found my queen dead at the entrance will the queen pheromone device work in keeping them queenless and happy until i can replace her or should i just let it be pun intended thanks so much okay so i'm curious it's so rare by the way to just find the queen dead at the entrance. I have a lot of questions. Because if I saw a queen bee dead at the entrance, I would be wondering, did they make a new queen? Is that a virgin fight? Did a queen kill another queen? What are the rest of the indicators in the hive? Are they noisy and unsettled? Are they calm and methodical? We need to know what's going on in this hive. How long do you have before you get a worker to start laying in the absence of a queen? Roughly three weeks. Because in the absence of the queen pheromone, and I'm, there's a reason why I'm mentioning this. In the absence of the queen pheromone, their little ovaries get activated. And I say little, they have fewer ovaries than the queen does. And uh, by the third week, they could actually be productive and start laying infertile eggs which is what produces male bees the drones so we've got three weeks at our disposal so we need to find out if in fact that is the queen or if that might have been a rival queen that died now if they're queenless you can put in synthetic qmp which is queen mandibular pheromone where do you get something like that i keep it in my freezer by the way, you probably don't have it in your freezer. You actually have to hunt for it. I get mine from Better Bee, no great surprise. I get a lot of stuff from Better Bee. Keep it in the freezer, always handy. So what happens is they look like these little semi-translucent noodles. You get two in a pack. They come with little zip ties and things. You put that in near the brood. And what it does is the bees, it's kind of sad too, because the bees all gather around that little noodle like it's a queen and they start trying to tend to it and so the pheromone tells the bees they have a fertile queen in there and that means that their little ovaries don't activate and now we don't have that three-week limit before a bee starts to lay eggs and starts to lay drones so yes you could put it in there so i recommend that people have it handy anyway i've done fun experiments with it went outside when a swarm was in the air and got a whole bunch of airborne bees to fly from the swarm onto my hand and then i took a clip and put that on a spruce tree and then I collected a swarm of bees that should actually be with a queen that took off but instead they got rerouted due to pheromones alone onto this QMP so it works so it could be a placeholder but where are you going to get a queen in three weeks or four weeks so we're in February you got to find a queen breeder so another option would be when we get a warm-up to combine those remaining bees with another colony. So you could do that with newsprint, things like that. 
a queen right colony so you just boost them or like i said you can just let them be and some people see that as cruel to let a colony without a queen just die out well they're not just they're not suffering and dying you have food and resources for them what they're doing is they're reaching the end of their life and then they're expiring at the normal end of their life they're not like dying early so those are the options and now we're at the fluff part we've finished with our questions for today so i have things to talk about and i need your help because i want to help somebody here today number one what did i promise you would be available today the long langstroth prints so the long langstroth prints are ready they are on my website i will leave a link down in the video description below so you can go to them hey friend how much does prints cost they're free so that's the one part promise delivered thank goodness number two Oh, there's a new interview page on my website, which is fredsfinefowl.com. And it just says interviews. And those are interviews that I've done with other people where I'm the host. There are also other people that have interviewed me on their channel. So I decided to create a page that would have all those interviews together. So you can look at those. There's a bunch of, bunch of them on there. I also want to thank Greg R. I didn't ask permission to use his full name. For making this really cool Varroa Destructor mite for me. It's a 3D print. And I'm going to be painting this to look like a real mite. But that thing is really cool. He's a viewer. He downloaded the print and made this and sent it to me as a present. So that's cool. So I thank Greg for that. And remember, each week we're doing a shout out. And we're going to help somebody out. So today's theme is what? Helping little people. Well, I don't want to say little people. I can insult them. So let's just help help young beekeepers. Okay. So today's shout out is for Darian, who is the backward beekeeper. Now I checked in on his channel before I come up to do this uh, Q and A today, and he has 533 subscribers on his channel. Now, for those of you who don't know, because a lot of you don't have YouTube channels and things like that, but I highly recommend you get a YouTube channel so you can cast your votes for people, so you can subscribe to them, so you can give them a thumbs up, so you can support them. And while we're talking about that, if you click a thumbs up on this video so you know you watched it, that's helpful too. But let's go to Darian, the backward beekeeper. The link is in the video description. He has 533 subs. Why is that significant? Until you hit 1,000 subscribers, you cannot monetize your channel. You cannot earn a dime. So advertisers on YouTube still advertise on channels that are under that thousand threshold. The difference is you don't get any of that. So I want to help Darian, the backyard beekeeper. Please go to his channel. Please subscribe. And I would love it if you would help us get him to that thousand subscriber threshold. He's promising a giveaway of some kind. So I don't know what he's giving away. But definitely tell him, tell him I sent you. Frederick Dunn sent us, and we're going to support youth in beekeeping, and we need more of them. Natalie's out there. Uh, those are like the only two young beekeepers that I know about. Natalie's doing really well on her own. Let's help Darian. So encourage the youth. And uh, that was it. So I'm glad you spent your time with me here today. I hope you're glad you spent time with me here today. And uh, when the weather warms up, make sure your bees are fed because we are entering the starvation zone up here in the northern United States. Thanks for watching. Have a fantastic weekend.